Good evening and welcome to this special Barbican Online event. My name is Sonia Zadurian and I'm one of the cinema curators at the Centre. I am thrilled to be welcoming you this evening to this screen talk for Spaceship Earth with director Matt Wolfe, hosted by Justin Jakeley, who is a curator at the Architecture Foundation. About a week ago, we launched our cinema on demand streaming service and we were really pleased to have Spaceship Earth feature as one of our launch titles. At the Barbican Centre, we regularly hold screen talks as part of our new release programme. And it's really great to be able to replicate this online while we're temporarily closed. I'd like to say a big, big thank you to the team at Dogworth and of course to our speakers this evening for helping to make this event possible. On Friday the 24th of July, the BAFTA-nominated drama Retablo will be launching on our Cinema On Demand platform. And following this, on Monday the 27th of July, we will have our next online screen talk with the film's director, Alvaro Delgado Aparicio, hosted by Barbican curator Alex Davidson. But now, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Justin and Matt. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Matt. Um, as Sonia said, my name is Justin Jakeley. I'm a curator at the Architecture Foundation. And more specifically, I curate the Architecture on Film season there, which um, the Architecture Foundation has been presenting in collaboration with the Barbican since 2008, somehow now. But I am much less important than tonight's guest, Matt Wolf, um, a celebrated director based in New York, um, who has been providing us with creative and insightful documentaries for now over a decade. So, some of you may have seen some of his previous films um, that start out with Wild Combination, a portrait of Arthur Russell, the downtown New York musician, um, which maybe perhaps uh, is uh, familiar with many of the Barbican's audience, I might think. Um, that was followed on by Teenage in 2014, uh, a real panoramic tale of shifting cultural trends without, throughout the 20th century, focused on the lens of the invention of the mythical character of the teenage. Um, and the demographic shifts um, that that represented, adapted from a book by John Savage. Then in 2019, we had Recorder, the Marion Stokes project, um, a portrait of a woman who recorded 24 hours of news, 24 hours a day for 30 years. And this moves on to the film we're talking about tonight, Spaceship Earth, um, coming a hot year after that previous project. Um, a film that hopefully some of you have seen, some of you may not have, but that we'll be here to speak about tonight um, in a film that is full of crazy amounts of resonances with the present um, and the cultural situation we both find ourselves within today and have done for, for the last decade or 30 or more years as well, I'm sure, go on to explain. I think what's interesting when thinking about Matt's work is what unites all these films really is an idea of and a sense of analyzing recent cultural history and allowing it to resonate in and with the present. And I think we'll probably be talking about that a lot tonight. Matt's work also often deals with the idea of biography and biography as a means of uh, revealing wider social realities through individual stories. And it also works rigorously with the archive um, as an idea, as a generator of ideas, um, as a resource for storytelling and discovery, and, and also within bigger questions of representation, I think. And it's much more the idea of representation than representation. But that's enough for me, really. Um, I'd like you all to join me in welcoming Matt. Normally, if we were doing this live, there would probably be a lovely round of applause, but instead, it's us too. Um, and Matt, um, thank you again for being here. I wish we were doing this at the Barbican itself. Um, like I know. we were just mentioning before, uh, every time I'm there, the Barbican's conservatory can't help but record the biosphere uh, too for me, actually, with his gleaming white metal struts, um, tropical vegetation, and a sense of being a kind of self-sealed environment. So. In an right. ideal world, that's what we I'm up. I'm obsessed with the Barbican, so <laughs> one day we'll come back, but um, I'm happy to be here and thank you for having me. Well, thank you. And I mean, I guess the best place to start is at the beginning, really. Um, and I'd like to ask you about the genesis of this film, really. Um, where does this film come from? How did you find this film or did this film find you, really? I guess starting at the beginning in terms of the genesis of this project. Yeah, I mean, when I come up with film ideas, I do a lot of speculative research on the internet. In fact, I'm between films now, so I've been doing that all the time. And um, it leads in unexpected directions. And I came across this striking image of eight people in, just like me, bright red jumpsuits, uh, standing in front of a glowing glass pyramid. 
And I genuinely thought it was a still from a science fiction film, but quickly realized that in fact, the structure was real and these people lived inside of it for two years. So um, I was determined to, to tell their story when I saw that image. And um, before long, I, I arrived at Synergia Ranch, a commune in uh, New Mexico, where many of the people who conceived of Biosphere 2 still live. And I was brought into this temperature controlled closet that had hundreds of 16 millimeter films and analog videotapes and thousands of images. And um, it was astonishing to me that this, um, this group and their project, Biosphere 2, had been regarded as this spectacular failure. And for the most part, their work had really faded from collective memory. And the fact that they had so meticulously documented their work and, and felt that there was historical significance to it, um, it was it was impressive to me and I felt a kind of urgency and responsibility to tell their story in the mm -hmm. context of catastrophic climate change that we face today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's interesting. I mean, within the film, of course, we end back in Synergia Ranch at the very close of the film, um, seeing seeing those characters who are still living through many of these ideas for 30, 40 years later. Um, but I think it's also fascinating to think that that might have been the start of the film as well, right? There's this mm -hmm. kind of uh, bracketing that's happening there. And I mean, I guess for me, one of the most striking things about, about the film and your approach to the biosphere story um, is this this setting really at the roots of it um, within the 60s, you know? Mm -hmm. um, there's clearly a, a, a much less nuanced film would have treated the um, situation as a kind of sci-fi thriller in essence, right? And whilst your film certainly bridges the, we are on the seat of our hooks in terms of anticipation of, of where the project is heading, you're much more generous with actually giving us a much bigger picture, a much broader panorama of where this project comes from. And it really is, it's from the 60s. It's, um, mm -hmm. it's from commune culture. Um, it's from what some people have referred to as the Californian mentality, I guess, as well. Um, maybe we could talk a little bit more about, um, about that decision to, to spend that time with um, the forces, the social forces really, which I guess gave rise to this project that would happen 30 years later. Yeah, I, I did go against conceptual, I mean, conventional logic to really focus just on Biosphere 2 as the subject of the film. The film, half of the film really looks at the prehistory of mm -hmm. this project and the group that came together to um, to realize it. And yes, they, they really came out of the moment in the late 60s, but particularly the early 70s where people so-called counterculturalists went back to the land um, to try to start anew, to live sustainably. Um, and this group was a little different. They didn't identify as hippies. They even rejected the term commune itself. Um, and they were really, like other counterculturalists, inspired by Buckminster Fuller. Um, you know, his model of a geodesic dome um, and its symbol of sustainable design was important to them and, and helped define a philosophy in which the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they built a geodesic dome at the center of their ranch, but they went further, um, inspired by Fuller's book, um, Synerge and Synergetics, they, mm -hmm. and his concept of synergy, they, they called their ranch Synergia Ranch and they called themselves synergists. Mm -hmm. um, and they also were involved in theater. They s established the theater of all possibilities. And uniquely, John Allen, the leader of this group, um, came from a Harvard MBA, was a metallurgist and, mm -hmm. you know, had decamped to Tangiers and been part of the avant-garde. Um, just with this varied background, he nonetheless decided that they weren't a commune, they were a corporation. Mm -hmm. And the group was very interested in pursuing business enterprises, but also becoming what they said was planetary. Mm -hmm. um, so they actually taught themselves, if you've seen the film, to build this enormous ship, and they traveled around the world and started these enterprises where they forged this kind of... Um, unusual uh, partnership with the former oil tycoon. The irony of that is, is apparent, you know, that they're pursuing ecological mm -hmm. projects with, a, with someone whose wealth comes from oil. But uh, to, to make a, a long story short, I think there's always been this history of the counterculture and its kind of, um, its connection to early cyber culture. Mm -hmm. um, this kind of arc of neoliberalism or the, the rise of conscious capitalism. Um, in which people aim to do projects that were both ecologically sustainable, that might improve our world, but also um, economically sustainable. And in some ways, this film is um, conceived to be inspiring about a group of people who 
um, man manage to literally reimagine a world, but it's also a cautionary tale about this model and the forces of capitalism and politics that often shortchange Vanguard projects. Mm -mm -mm -mm. No, I think that's so, it's so true and so present, this tension within the film, within between uh, applied thinking. I mean, the real joy of this is that people are trying to be pragmatic, um, mm -hmm. uh, pragmatic players within affecting and being agents of change uh, within shaping the earth, um, whilst also having an awareness of the forces that um, come from outside to, to compromise that or to influence it in certain ways. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the tale of Ed Bass is fascinating as well, of course, because um, as you were describing, he was a Texan oil billionaire, right? I think maybe the, was he the mm -hmm. fourth, fourth richest family, I think the film a frames very very powerful Texas oil family, yeah, yeah. And then for those of you who have seen the film, not to give too much away, I don't want any spoilers or something, it's very much kind of the logic of um, capital that in the end becomes the projects I'm doing somewhat um, towards the end of it. It's business interests um, that, that skew its future direction and end up shutting certain aspects of the project down. Mm -hmm. um, and I find it a fascinating thing to, to see. And I mean, in some ways, there's so many tangents we could go off um, through here, but um, it's worth noting that not only does the film start in the 60s, but it really starts on the streets of San Francisco. Um, and of course, with this conversation kind of around um, around cyber culture and its links to the ecological movement and everything else, I think um, in the same year that your film starts in 1966, um, supposedly, maybe it's an apocryphal story, but I believe it's true that Stuart Brand was walking around the streets of San Francisco, handing out um, buttons for people to wear, saying, "When will we? When will we see an image of planet Earth?" Um, mm -hmm. so this idea of images and image imaging as well. Um, and of course, with that, we think about kind of Ed Bass, and you can't help but um, then think of a figure like Elon Musk as well. And I mean, maybe this is one of the ways to start unpacking um, the film's resonances with the present and the extraordinary amounts that there are. Um, I'm interested maybe more in framing this as a question in terms of when did you start working on this project um, and how many of these resonances um, were planned and how many of them have, have developed as the project has continued? Yeah, I mean, I started making the film about two years ago. So I saw the contemporary relevance of the project. I thought that 30 years of hindsight um, was the right amount of time to reappraise the project and to look at it in a new light because it really was discounted and rebuked in its time. Um, and I saw so many prescient themes in it, particularly um, related to environmentalism and climate change. Um, but yeah, also this group aimed to pilot Mars colonization and to model sustainable living on Earth. Um, and they did that around a charismatic leader. Um, they were called a cult. And all of these things are kind of relevant to the 90s dot com culture in our present day kind of quote unquote disruptive um, model of capitalism because, um, you know, so many, um, you know, the project was criticized for existing outside of established institutions like academia or NASA. Um, but so many of the kind of models of innovation that exist right now, for better or worse, are privately funded ventures that revolve around a cult of personality of some sort of CEO and that um, have futurist aims um, yeah. that uh, envision a, a kind of sustainable living or a, a model for the future living. Um, that's meant to make money. And mm -hmm. so in so many ways, this project was existing in that model, but it was before that. Um, it also w became a mass media phenomenon, really stoked, uh, I think, an appetite for entertaining voyeurism amongst the public. And after Biosphere 2, um, things like The Real World and, and Big Brother and Survivor would mm -hmm. come about. So in a lot of ways, it was um, anticipating certain cultural and business um, trends. It was futuristic and also prescient in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think the element of this film being about a group of people who were quarantined together uh, for two years, that certainly wasn't predicted. The film premiered in Jan January, mm -hmm. um, never in, I mean, nobody could have ever imagined that that particular aspect of the film, the human experiment of people being self-contained would would be relevant to people today, and obviously it is. Mm -hmm. And I think in terms of thinking about that, I, I this film was released in, in the US um, right as the quarantine really was settling in. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot has shifted uh, since then and, and continues to shift as we contemplate the long-term reality of, of our circumstances. But I think that um, I really reflected on the Biospherians accounts of, of the end of their two-year mission, coming out and really 
having a sense of personal transformation from living in a small closed system in which they couldn't take anything for granted. Um, and that forever after they would never, um, you know, even consider a breath as a given in, in the larger outside system. And, and so as we were in the, the earlier stages of um, the quarantine, I really wondered um, if this film resonates with this idea of personal transformation through an mm -hmm. experience of um, deprivation of the outside world. And um, I wonder if that's true. We, we basically must personally transform to collectively reimagine the world because there is no going back to normal. And I think some of the experiences of the biospherians relate to that in a way that never I never could have anticipated. Mm -mm 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 -mm. No, it's true. I mean, I also noticed just a few weeks after the film started rolling out, um, actually in, in its release in the USA, of course, um, the Launch America event happened uh, mid-pandemic um, mm. as well. Yeah, it's true. The first, uh, first Americans being launched to space from American soil since 2011, of course, in collaboration with SpaceX and Elon mm -hmm. Musk. Yeah. Um, and these kind of extra resonances, again, they just roll like layers. For those of you who have or have, haven't seen the film, I'll just throw out the word Steve Bannon, who makes a, a cameo towards the end as well. Um, I think there's, there's so many of these threads that kind of wrap up um, to help unpack our present moment. I find it fascinating. But the other film is, as much as reflecting on the planet, I do find there's this, um, the film also engages with the imaginarium of space, I think, which was the motivation behind, to some extent, behind the Launch America project, which again was designed to be a massive a media event. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe I could ask you about how you feel the, the kind of space as a metaphor has changed or works for you whilst you're researching and working on this project. Um, it seems to be something we maybe turn to in times of um, the global tension or looking for a, an escape. I don't know, maybe you're talking about unpacking the idea of, of space as perceived through this project and then as a resource or a metaphor. Yeah, I mean, I can first think about the title of the film, Spaceship Earth, which is obviously the, the title of Buckminster Fuller's seminal um, countercultural tome uh, operating manual for Spaceship mm -hmm. Earth and, and represents those 60s ideals mixed with um, the name of the Epcot amusement park ride, Spaceship Earth, which itself is a kind of cartoonish geodesic dome that has animatronic vignettes that all look at progress in the future. And um, that kind of potent combination of idealism and theme park, 60s idealism and, and theme park theatrics, I thought really spoke to um, the aesthetic and also the, the strange spirit of Biosphere 2. Um, mm. and, and there was a science fiction dimension to it as well. In the film, um, we show clips from Silent Running, a 1970s science fiction film uh, in which they happen to wear bright red jumpsuits. And um, it, it's, it really revolves around themes of environmental catastrophe and, and closed systems in, in outer space. And so um, I really, to me, it's less about space, it's more about futurism mm -hmm. and, and what futurist projects look like at different um, cultural moments mm -hmm. and, um, and what value systems are in place for those. And, um, you know, this, this, this project was futurist in, in regards to um, economics and ecology, but I think now um, we're in a different cultural moment thinking about equity and justice. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what I've been thinking about in terms of futures or alternative futures is how inextricable uh, sustainability is with equity. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think um, mm -hmm. the nature of futurism continues to evolve through different decades. And what's interesting about this story is it's, it's a futuristic story that spans half a century. Mm -hmm. I should I should mention as well that we are taking questions and some of them have been cropping up on the side, maybe in relation to what we were just speaking about in terms of science fiction and futurism and things. One of these questions is whether any sci-fi works of fiction, films, TV or books, which particularly influence the final piece. Now we've talked, uh, we were just discussing that a little bit, but I mean, maybe if you were able to expand on um, whether any of those ideas influence the way you constructed the film itself. Not really, because I'm not that big of a sci-fi geek. Like, you know, I'm not a space geek. I'm not a sci-fi geek. I'm not really a um, self-identified environmentalist, although that shifted by making the film. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't come to the film really with these kind of genre interests. I, can't, I make films often about artists or people who pursue projects that have the logic of artists. And this group, they are artists. Um, they were engaged in theater. And um, they obviously had a wild visual imagination and prioritized aesthetics in the creation of Biosphere 2. But I think about people who um, are pursuing visionary or vanguard projects that are unprecedented. 
um, mm -hmm. and to create new worlds and speak in new languages. Um, and so often people who do that, particularly many artists are misunderstood or discounted or overlooked in their time and reappraised later, um, mm -hmm. often after they've died. And in this case, I'm, I'm had the good fortune to reappraise the work of this group while, while they're living. So um, to me, I, I came into it more with an interest in art and artists, mm -hmm. um, and as I was mentioning, futurism. Mm -hmm. um, and, all, and that really um, brought me into thinking about science fiction and futurism and counterculture and technology. Mm -hmm. And maybe through that, it's uh, I'd like to talk about the character of John Allen, actually, really, who is, again, the, the found, real founder of this movement and of the theatre of all possibilities um, and of the, the threads that tie up with the Biosphere 2 project, again, which was very much his, his baby to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, and in some ways, you know, the, the film can be seen as a kind of... Uh, almost as a biography of John Allen, again. Mm -hmm. um, he's there as a constant thread throughout the, the film. Um, and I'd like to ask you about the process of working with him, actually. Um, he's on camera, he gives some interviews, um, but the film is taking such a big pa panorama of the, the tentacles of this project um, that I, I guess it doesn't, uh, it doesn't afford him the control that I think he's probably used, quite used to having. So I'm fascinated about the experience of working with him and his process of reflecting on the film as well. Well, I will say John's in his early 90s. He's, he's old. And so, yeah. um, you know, it was in some ways challenging to have him reflect on the scope of his entire life. But I was fortunate that he was willing to be interviewed. He often, mm -hmm. you know, to sometimes, uh, uh, you know, refuse to be interviewed or to appear in the media during the height of Biosphere 2's fame or infamy, you could say. Mm -hmm. and, and his reluctance to speak about the project publicly in the media often um, stoked more skepticism. Um, mm -hmm. So I was fortunate that he felt comfortable and was willing to talk with us, but he's a mercurial figure. Um, he often kind of breaks down uh, individual words and statements and tries to deconstruct them. And I found that to be somewhat evasive sometimes, mm -hmm. but I also recognized and realized that he is d not looking to have a kind of fixed perspective on anything. He's always, kind of darting around to different facets of an idea. And I can imagine that that kind of voracious intellectual curiosity and that unwillingness to, to kind of define an explicit dogma was very alluring to a group of young people who, um, you know, uh, were brought under um, his umbrella into a space in which they were encouraged to pursue things and ideas that were completely unfamiliar to them. And I recognized while talking to this group that while John Allen was an effective leader, he often led from behind, sort of pushing people to do things that they hadn't done before. And mm -hmm. in, that, in that position as, as an older figure, uh, in some ways a patriarch of this group, um, there is a certain complexity to him as a figure. He, um, I think, could be authoritative. I think there was a breakdown in leadership during the Biosphere 2 mission. He certainly took the brunt of the criticism for the project as well, and there was division amongst the Biospherians about his style of management and the decisions he was making about um, the, the execution of the project and transparency around it. So like a lot of, you know, big personalities and gregarious figures, it doesn't come without complexity. And I found aspects of him to be impenetrable, but other things to be pretty intriguing about him because he clearly inspired and held together and continues to hold together a pretty, um, a pretty active and um, tenacious group of people. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how much of that is um, is written upon his face, or at least in the way you shoot him as well. I think um, he's often framed within a within a geodesic dome, um, but his eyes um, sparkle with a with a magnetism that I still still translates through the screen. Yeah, he's a very kind of cinematic looking guy. He's mm -hmm. um, he has quite a presence, but um, I think he doesn't. He's the dramaturg of mm -hmm. the theater of all possibilities. He doesn't aim necessarily to be its protagonist. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, that's very interesting as well, because one of the other things I, I noticed within the film is there is a constant, uh, there's a repeated scene of John Allen kind of leading a physical uh, physical theater workshop, it seems, mm -hmm. from behind, that becomes almost a chorus or a refrain within the film. Um, mm -hmm. Keeps coming back as a, as, a, as a thread of glue that takes us, um, takes us to a certain place conceptually. And I wanted to ask you about the significance of that scene for you um, and, and the way it's uh, utilized within the film and the storytelling. 
Well, I always wanted to center the fact that this group was engaged in the avant-garde and that for some viewers, I recognized that it would make them seem like a cult. And for other viewers with a certain sensibility, it would give just another layer of interest to the how idiosyncratic and eclectic this group's, this group's interest and activities were. I'm of the second group who doesn't think experimental theater is cult-like. I recognize this film has had a fairly mainstream release, so I recognize that there's others who think it's totally bizarre. But I mean, the group, the group was aiming to do a couple things with theater to do exercises that engage different energies, as they would say, um, to engage with history through archetypes and historic uh, works mm -hmm. of theater, and also to simulate group dynamics um, as they would play out in projects. And one piece of theater that I return to multiple times is The Wrong Stuff, the kind of black mm -hmm. comedy parody of uh, the Biosphere 2 mission that the Biospherians performed in this sort of carnivalesque way right before their mission, but that much of the calamities that are, are kind of satirized in that play became the realities inside. Mm -hmm. So to me, the, the theater was an interesting way to frame them as outliers of conventional science, but also to show the ways that they anticipated kind of group dynamics and conflicts, but also um, the irony that some of those things came true as they entered the world stage of the media in this kind of transparent, um, you know, theatrical dome. Mm -mm 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 -mm. It's really, I mean, it's amazing. This The, the play that you just mentioned, the, the wrong stuff, I think it's called, right? The fact that this kind of self-parody was being performed by the, by the troupe on the eve of um, undertaking a $200 million project. <laughs> Really is such an incredible illustration of the, um, of yeah, the, the bizarre, imaginative, <laughs> and prophetic aspect of this group and their project. Exactly, exactly. It's it's incredible, and to be that self-reflexive, that playful, but also that bold to really be pursuing something with them. Um, with such dynamic and, and pragmatic aims. Um, and I think going from theatre leads us on organically to kind of talk about the nature of um, Biosphere 2 as a media event as well. Mm -hmm. We've reflected on this a little bit, but I'm very interested in how, you know, to some extent the Biosphere experiment could be thought of as a piece of living theatre. Um, how conscious that was in the group of uh, the protagonists, how much you see the project this way or not. Um, I, f I find the links there quite fascinating. Yeah, and I saw that and thought about that quite a bit too. Um, and and in so many senses, if John Allen was the dramaturg of Biosphere Two, the the, mm -hmm. the narrative kind of spiraled out of his control, and that was part of the downfall of the project. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I think that um, in a lot of senses, art and theater were kind of downplayed with the project as the credibility of its participants came under question. Not all mm -hmm. of them were artists. Some were like Lynn DeLay, an ecologist doing field work, or Dr. Roy Walford. Actually, he was a theater performer, but also a, a doctor. Um, and I think that they were making art and doing theater inside quite a bit, but that just the idea that they were in this kind of transparent terrarium that people made pilgrimages to see and that news cameras from around the world were gazing inside. I mean, there's just undeniably a theatrical dimension to that, but I like to think of Biosphere 2 as an experiment beyond the confines of a traditional hypothesis-driven scientific experiment. It was a human experiment in so many mm -hmm. senses. And mm -hmm. in a closed system, it wasn't just ecological, um, factors that were creating a, a kind of sustainable atmosphere or, or sustenance through agriculture. It was um, human beings who were provide who who were perhaps the most unstable element in that closed system. Um, they did coalesce mm -hmm. to to complete their mission, but it was and as it is in our larger world, human beings who provide. Um, the most instability in a system. And I think that was allegorized in a sense that was a kind of theater, uh, you know, modeled after the, our larger world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Maybe I'd like to ask you also more generally by building the film, I guess, in essence as well. The film is very, very elegantly put together with deep archive work, um, interviews, and also music. I'd like to ask you about working with the composer Owen Pallett, who you previously worked with on Recorder, I believe, as well. Um, I'm interested in how you you weave these textures together to tell your story, and and also maybe how that relates to certain tensions within kind of entertaining and, and critiquing as well, which I guess is mm -hmm. one of your functions as a film make or to some extent or this idea of seducing us into a story but also giving us an, an expanded um, intellectual capacity to deal with it. Yeah I'm always most interested in telling stories that have a lot of specificity but also some universality and that um, traffic and really idiosyncratic and unique characters and stories 
but that point towards much larger ideas that are both intellectual and emotional. I mean, those are all my kind of overlapping goals when making a mm -hmm. film. And I think that the aesthetic of those films is often defined by the archival footage I use since I make mm -hmm. mostly archive driven films. And um, for this film, I loved that it was all of this handheld 16 millimeter film, but mostly like beta cam home movie footage. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, it's a, it's a half century epic about a group of people who create an, a new world. And so I wanted there to be a really epic score and Owen Pallet, the incredible musician, um, he really traverses both uh, kind of synths and orchestral music, full orchestra music. And, and he wanted to make a full orchestral score and we did that. So it brings a kind of epic dimension to the film, but there's also um, elements of science fiction in there as well. And for me, I love films that are filled with music and that create a, a kind of dynamic and sweeping quality to them. So um, the film has just, it has almost an hour worth of original music in it. So um, th that's available to listen to on Spotify if people are interested. But um, yeah, music was an important way to stitch together all of this disparate material uh, over 600 hours of archival footage. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's, it's again, this, um, this, this connection between the epic and the highly intimate and the highly idiosyncratic that really seems to be at the heart of, of the film you present us with and also the project as a whole then and its explosion of certain ideas of, of births of certain forms of planetary thinking and um, cautionary tales for where these can, can go wrong, um, also promise and inspiration for where they could perhaps potentially be resolved in the future that makes, um, that makes the project so extremely valuable. You mentioned earlier that you've been spending this time researching a new project, and it may well be remarkably too early, but I wondered if there was anything or any keywords or anything else you could tell us about it as we head towards mm, the end of our conversation. My lips are sealed. Um, I should have known. <laughs> there's, there's stuff, but I can't say yet. It's too early. Yeah. But um, I hope I'm making a film really soon. You know, it's a tough time, but I love filmmaking, and um, I think... I'll have something for you sooner than later, I hope. <laughs> There's lots percolating. Well, we look forward to seeing it. I've been told we're, we're reaching the end of our time. So I'd like to thank the Barbican and Togwa for most of all, Matt Wolf, um, for thank spending you. time with us from New York today into the virtual ether. Um, and to remind everyone that the Spaceship Earth is available in Barbican's virtual cinema until the 7th of August. And if you'd like to commemorate the passing of time, why not watch it on the 20th of July, which will be the 61st anniversary of the moon landing, um, and maybe a fitting time to reflect on some of these questions. But Matt, thank you enormously. Um, thank you for the film. Good luck with the future. We know we know how many challenges there are for filmmakers um, at the moment, and I wish you all the very best with this current project. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Matt.